All right, hey y'all. I'm recording this video during my winter break from teaching. Those of you that teach know that teaching is a wonderful source of inspiration and you, you learn all sorts of things from yourself and your students as you're teaching. But breaks are also good as times to sit down and think. So I opened my break by rereading this book, Do, by Jeffrey Stollett, just talking about real-time performance of electronic music. And it really struck home for me that I haven't been doing very much of this lately. Recently, and again, if you've been watching some of my videos, you know this, I've just been setting up systems either in Pure Data or on my Eurorack that generate music without me having to touch them. As I've mentioned, I've been interested in feedback loops, but I've been taking the human being out of this feedback loop. Now, I've been recording these videos during a pandemic, and while I'm extremely grateful that I have a job and was able to keep it through the pandemic, my job got significantly more challenging, and quite frankly, I had far less control of many aspects of my life. Hey, and so this is kind of mirrored in these generative systems that I've been making. I set up the patch, and then I released the responsibility of creating beautiful music to the patch. Additionally, playing music is hard. Practice is hard. And so finishing a hard day's work, setting up a patch, having a beverage as I lay back in my chair and listen to it and record it has a great deal of appeal. But at the moment, during a break, time to think, time to reorient. I like to change the direction of this musical expression and reintroduce human control into these pieces. Now, even for these generative systems, I have my human control of how I set up that system, and there's lots of great stuff to explore in generative music too. So I'm certainly not saying I'm done with it. But I do come back to Theodore Adorno's 1966 essay on education after Auschwitz, where he says, People are inclined to take technology to be the thing itself, as an end in itself, a force of its own, and they forget that it is an extension of human dexterity. So in this reorientation, I want to put together a quick video today bringing together some of these ideas that I've explained with Eurorack with a little bit of human dexterity. I've decided today to use an old joystick that, that I've had for a while. I really like these. I have a bunch of these in my office. They're pretty cheap. Logic Extreme 3D Pro. I think they're less than $20 each. And I like them because, you know, in addition to the, I mean, they're big and there's the joystick motion in the usual ways. And then they have this little button for moving around there. It also, I don't know if you can see that it's got like a, a, a tilt control there and it's got all sorts of different ways to put in information. Maybe we'll just use the X and Y of the joystick for today, but there's plenty to work with. Of course, for musical control, this friend also exists and there's nothing wrong with this too. But my experience is as a string player, not a keyboard player. And once I bring a piano into the mix, I have to grapple with 200 years of performance practice that comes with it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get information into the computer from this joystick using Max, and then I'm gonna map it to parameters that my little nifty case here can handle. In this case, it's gonna be MIDI information. I'm using Max today instead of PD because getting in data from external devices is a little bit more straightforward in Max. Again, I want the focus today about musical control of systems rather than getting bogged down with the minutia of how to put things together. So let's get a human being, me, back in this feedback loop. Okay, so today in Max, our heavy lifting is gonna be done by the high object, standing for human interface. As we always know, we can right click and open the help. I'm gonna try to fly by the seat of my pants and not, not use the help, but we'll see how I do. I'm going to need a message here called menu. I'm gonna pass into the high object. I'm going to need a U menu which is a drop-down list. I'm going to take out from there and then run it back in here. So this is a bit weird, but check this out. Now, when I hit menu, bank, I've populated a list, command E, of all of the different things that I can pull in here. And unfortunately, I do not see my joystick. And the reason is I didn't plug it in. It's not gonna like it if I just plug it in now, unfortunately, I don't think that's going to work. Let's find out if we hit this menu again. Nope, not there. File, save as. Okay, so I've just restarted, max that is. Click the menu again, ah, Logitech Extreme 3D. So I was planning on saying this anyway, but 
Make sure everything you need for Max is plugged in before you start the program. That includes many devices too. All right, so here's my Logitech Extreme. Now this high is gonna pass us out information about this Logitech Extreme. The one thing I need to do here though, Command E, is I need to start pulling it. I need to start telling it to read what's coming in from that joystick. So that's another message. Go to my menu, Command D, pull 10. Let's run that in, bink, bink. So now let's add another object underneath this high and we'll add our print. Okay, I'm gonna move this window over here. Oh, it's already getting something. And now I'm gonna grab my joystick. So much data here, tons and tons of data. I'm gonna stop and leave it alone for a second. We've still got a little bit of a wiggle. We're seeing 19s and things like that. We can see that what comes out of the high is a set of two numbers. One number is labeling the control and the second number is the value of that control. If you've heard me ramble about MIDI data, it's kind of a similar thing, but this is relatively arbitrary based on what device we have plugged in. And we've got to figure out how we're going to get it out. So I can start doing some things with route here. Now we know we saw a 19 and a 20 in there. So now with this route, I can see the numbers that are coming off there. Let me grab a number box and let's see what's happening with 19. And let's see what's happening with 20. Ah, okay. So 19 seems to be my Y. 20, I'm not getting much from. Let me play with some other things. Oop. Uh, 20 was this little joystick up top. That's not what I want to use today. I've got my Y there, so if the Y is 19, I'm going to betcha. 18, 19 are going to give me the two axes of this joystick. Let's see how I did. X, 0, maximum 1023. Y, 0, maximum 1023. All right, so now I have some joystick controls. 0 to 1023, those are a little bit unsurprising numbers because two to the what is 1020, let's see, the two to the eighth is 256, so double it, double it, so it's, it's 10 bits for that message, okay. Now, that isn't extremely musically useful for us, so let's go here. Actually, while I'm at it, let me just grab a comment. X, Command J, sorry, Command D, Y. Okay, so now we have those labeled. We're probably gonna want a little bit more space, honestly. Let's do that. Now Max, again, is wonderful because it has this useful scale object. So we know we're getting the numbers 0 to 1024, and I could scale those to be 0 to 127. Eh, if I want to make it more like a piano, I could scale it to be 21 to 108 right? Because that's going to be the range of the 88 keys on a piano keyboard. Now, why am I thinking about scaling it to those values? Well, let's uh, see what happens if we turn this into notes. So I'm going to take another number here, just so we can see what's happening. So now I move my stick. This is just the X that I've got matched here. Sorry, my mouse is in the way there. 21 to 107. Oh yeah, I should make this scale 0, 10, 20. Three. 21, 108. Okay, and so now I could just put a make note, velocity 127, duration, and we're pulling every 10 milliseconds, so let's make this 10 milliseconds long. And we'll put it on channel one, but it doesn't really matter at the moment. And then what we're gonna need is we're gonna need a note out something to send that note out so this make note is making my midi note and this note out is sending it out in this case sending it out just to the internal synth so let's listen to this all 
High notes. Oh no. Okay, that's pretty good. Uh, if I wanted to, I could just duplicate this. Pink. Set that to MIDI channel 2. I don't need the two note outs here, I guess I could do. Like this. All right, or I could set this instead to be, uh, scale it from zero to 127, which is the full MIDI range. And I could pass that number in to the velocity here. Loud. Quiet. Quiet as in inaudible. A little bit in the middle. Okay, neat. I'm gonna undo that, get back to making two notes. And the reason that I have uh, two make notes here, or that shouldn't be sitting on channel, channel 12, that'd be two, is because my nifty case takes in MIDI information through this USB, and then it passes that out, MIDI channel one on CV1, MIDI channel two on CV2, uh, and then if I wanted to do a continuous controller, I could send that out the mod here. But what we'll do is we'll just pass this out. Now, I do know one additional piece of information, which is that the range of MIDI on the nifty case is a little bit different. This is because generally oscillators are one volt per octave. Now there's no way that it could go beyond 127 because that's the maximum that you can send in a MIDI message and we're sending MIDI messages down this wire. But I'd happen to know that the minimum for the nifty case, and again, I've done a firmware update, so it might be different, is 24 and the maximum is 119. So I'm going to set these both to be 24, 119. Now, this is, what, 8 octaves? So it's 8 volts. So when it's at 24, when the value of MIDI note is 24, it's sending 0 volts out of here. And then when it's at 119, it's sending about 8 volts out of that. Because, uh, again, it's the 1 volt per octave. Okay, so now let's wire something up and see how we do. So we'll start with the most obvious thing, which would be just an oscillator. CV goes into the oscillator. Square wave to the output. Give me that a bit more juice on my mixer. Let's see if we do it. Oops, that's not working because I haven't told it where to send that note out to. So let's go lock it down. No doubt. Uh, no, that's cut off in, in houses. But here's my create audio case. Think. So right now I'm only listening on channel one. But that seems pretty effective. Now it's worth noting that these are quantized. These these voltages are quantized to different notes. Okay. into a second oscillator. And that oscillator can go to the app. Now there's some dead space in here. I think uh, this particular oscillator only cares up to five volts. So there's some space where it doesn't do anything. So if I wanted to make that five volts, let me turn that down for a sec. Uh, let me think about that. Five volts, one volt per octave, five octaves. 24 plus five octaves is gonna be 84. Edit. Just on two, we'll go up to 84. Okay, let's try it. Okay, let's take original oscillator, 
mix it together with the second oscillator and send that to the output. Uh, I mean, I can send these. Well, well, okay, that's that's a kind of a crummy counterpoint machine. I'm just gonna redo that so they're both 2419 again. 119. Let's unplug. Let's now instead. Take the output of this triangle wave, run it. So CV1 still controls the pitch of that oscillator. Triangle wave goes into a wave folder. Let me choose a nice shorter wire for that. Triangle wave goes into the wave folder. Wave folder goes to the output. And CV2 controls the CV of the wave folder. Pitch. Handle. Sawtooth wave into the filter. Filter out. TV control. I'm sending data that only has a resolution of, what, 96, right? And so if I wanted to, I could slew that or smooth that out with, with voltage-wise. I unfortunately can't smooth that out in max because my nifty case can only receive MIDI data. So I can't smooth it before I send it, uh, before it's received, but I can smooth it with this after that. Yeah, okay, we've, we've come up with some relatively simple ways to get control data in. But hey, I've got all these buttons here. Uh, I could I could do something else where I send information about which button is being pressed. Now, uh, what do you do with this? Well, as long as you have a place to put in voltage here, you have a place to control the sound. So you can control the timbre like I was doing with the filter and the wave folder here, or the filter and the wave folder here. We could control envelope length if we want to do that. Oh, we didn't do anything with envelopes. So let's take this. Um, let's take the output of our square wave. We'll put it into this multiplier. So that's just basically like, like a VCA. We'll take the gate. So again, remember notes are being triggered here. So we'll uh, take that in and then we will multiply those together. And finally, to the out. So this gate is, is sending a gate when the MIDI note is going on, right? Or it's, it's sending, it's, it's positive when the note is on and it's releasing it when it's off. Now we currently have this pole set to be 10. Let's set our pole instead to be 90. Click it. Oh, I have the cycle on there, that's not helping. You get the general idea. 
So what we've ended up with here is pretty simple, but we have this general idea of a new way to get in control. Now, I know there are Eurorack joysticks that exist. I think they cost a few hundred dollars. My $20 joystick requires a software solution intermediary, but you do what you can. Eh, so we don't really have an instrument built yet, but here are a couple points to take away. Now I've given myself real-time control in this system, so as I listen, I can make musical decisions about what to do. Eh, currently I can only control pitch and timbre, but it's not that hard to make something that's more sophisticated and gives us more nuanced control. I could build something in Max that, based on the joystick's X position, sends MIDI messages to channel 1 or channel 2, thus letting me switch timbrely between oscillators. Oh man, why wouldn't I just do that? Let's do it. All right, I think I finally got this now. Ah, no, I didn't. 71 goes to this inlet. This one goes to... Ah, there we go. Okay, let's try it in practice. CV2. Sawtooth. Okay, there are our space sounds. Let's combine this now with our envelope. So what's coming out of here, we'll use... All right, there you go. Now maybe we'll build on this idea a little bit more in future videos, but I'll leave it there for now. Now I'm part of that feedback loop. I'm listening to the results and I'm acting on what I want to do. Nothing wrong with generative music, nothing wrong with generative systems, but maybe thematically I'll control my own fate for a little while. Good luck, show me what you come up with. <laughs>